be nice to me. Welcome, Brian. Hey, Peg. I, I promise no sibling rivalry today. So, um, what's up? Well, today I was hoping you'd talk a little bit about how you created the header logo for biology and science fiction. Both uh, the creative process and maybe some of the technical details. Uh, the creative process, well, we had talked about it, obviously, and I think we were talking back during the holidays, even, so about a year ago, getting okay. close to a year. And, you know, the, of course, when I work with any client, it's finding out what the client needs and really trying to make sure that's clear to all of us. We have to, we have, to have it pretty clear, otherwise it doesn't work, right? So maybe and you so could put up a picture of what our final choice for the logo was. Ah, uh, I'd be happy to do that. Give me one second here. And do, 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 do. it's going to take me one second due to a little technical glitch here, but we'll just keep talking. Uh, it's, um, I, uh... So maybe you could talk a little bit about how you created the image. Did you start with a hand drawing that you scanned in, or did you do it all on the computer? This one, uh, I, you know, I do a different combinations for different projects. This one was pretty much all on the computer. Um, I started basically, basically we, part of the thing that really helped was that we knew exactly pretty, pretty much what you wanted. You know, it, it's, uh, let me, give me a second there. I'm going to bring up the image and show everyone. Um, you know, it, and, and that's one thing as an artist I love when I work with a client, uh, hopefully it's showing there, is that, um, that people who know what they want makes it easier for me because otherwise I might create something and then they'll say, well, no, I wanted a, a cow instead, and it'd be like, what? So, you know, that's probably the early stages, though, of planning. So here's the logos. Here's the one on the bottom down here you can see is the final one on your blog, uh, Biology and Science Fiction, with this adorable mouse. Um, someday we'll have to give the mouse a name. Maybe you could do a contest, and um, people can name him, because it'd be nice. He's pretty cute. Uh, we got, And you can see different versions I made with the same logo. And one of the things that's important with graphic design, and particularly for some of you, your uh, audience out there who might be bloggers or web web folks who want to get some graphic design commission for them. Um, part of it is being able to create something that can be reused different ways. Uh, up here you see a circular one. This is sort of your Google Plus, your Facebook. Um, next to it, I sort of rotated um, a banner that you use on your blog to go to a different section for free science fiction. And basically, being able to really brand your website. So can you talk a little bit about how you created it technically? Did you draw the image on the computer first in Photoshop or use a different program? I was using Adobe Illustrator, which is a vector-based program. Uh, basically, Photoshop you think of as pixels. They're little dots next to each other forming an image. Uh, vectors um, look something like this. Um, sort of think of them as a 2D version of a three of like a CGI. If you ever see a CGI animation for a Pixar film, they'll have a wireframe. This is like a wireframe. All these points here are mathematically calculated, so you can scale them, change them, alter them, and they'll look the same no matter what you do. Uh, so here's the final elements. You see, here's the mouse, here's the sign, and here's a DNA trail too. And the DNA trail works really good with Illustrator because I could just copy the patterns and then basically distort them and tweak them and twist them in the program. And so then you combine all of those elements together into the final image? Yeah, so once again, here's our mouse. Uh, we have the overlapping DNA trail. We have the sign. And then I brought all those elements into Photoshop, layered them together, and then was able to add shading. So for instance, you see there's a dimensionality to the lettering and to the sign. There's the mouse has a um, little flame glow there, a little highlight on his belly, a little, little twinkle in his eye, little shadows. I added some shading to the DNA structure in the back, uh, some faint stars, and really trying to give it a texture and, and a little bit more complex. But the, the truth be told, you want to keep 
the the basic uh, sort of silhouette graphic uh, iconic element of that mouse. Um, can I show you uh, an earlier clip peg? Is that okay? Sure. So here's an earlier version, and you can see this is the early mouse here. Pretty much stayed the way it is. And what happened was it started with a black and white design. Whenever you do a graphic design, a logo, particular, anything that you're going to reuse a lot, especially, you design it pretty much as one color to start with. Um, you want it to be able to read if you print with a one-color business card. If it's only half-inch tall, you want that mouse to stand out. Um, this is pretty clear, I think, right now. You can kind of see it's a mouse shape and all that fun stuff. You can also see we tried different versions of it. Let me bring up some others, too. And so what made you think of a mouse? I remember we talked a little bit back and forth, but I think that was originally your idea. Well, you know, it's biology and science fiction, and... You know, when you think biology, you can think of a human being. You could think of that classic, uh, was it Leonardo da Vinci with a man, sort of with the, you know, the forearms and the four legs and the circles and the mathematics. There's a lot of different things people think of. The secret is to have something that is readily connects to the audience uh, in some way. And this is a mouse with a rocket pack. So what else, what more could you think of when you think of biology and science fiction? Um, mm. And it's more positive because... Mice do end up seemingly being um, experimented upon and things in science fiction. And this is a mouse kind of on his own in space having a good time, sort of, how I see it. And you did a couple of other versions too, right? Yeah, so when we started off, I was able to take the files, and this is bringing them into Photoshop, and you can see I'm playing with, I drew in the, ta uh, the um, DNA trail, which we didn't have yet at that point. Um, here's a different version. You see the mouse is a different color, different shapes. Just playing with what looks good. One of the conflicts that you have with graphic design in this case is that uh, the mouse, the blue of the mouse is too close to the background in value. Uh, the same goes for this one here. Uh, look at the color of the mouse, the band, and the sign, the brown. They're all about the same value. So basically they don't read very well from a distance. They don't, they don't pop so to speak. Mm -hmm. Let me just so. back. Now, is this sort of the typical process that you use when you're doing illustrations and logos on commission? Uh, I do different techniques based on what the project is. Sometimes I will, uh, generally it will always end up in the computer in some form. It all depends what it is. So, for instance, if it's just a logo, like text, you know, and stuff, I'll usually pretty much do most of it digitally because the, the need is there. You need to have branding images that you can scale and change. The great thing about Adobe Illustrator's files is that you can even cut vinyl out of material by um, all those mathematic points can be read by a program and a, a knife can cut vinyl that you stick onto windows and stuff like that, uh, which I used to do in, in my past life. Nice. And, and so it's really powerful. You know, this is um, you know, once again, uh, very similar to the ideas of, of some of the things we're seeing with uh, 3D printing and stuff like that, but in a, a flat way, basically. So. And <clears throat> I know you also do what you call motion comics, or when you sort of animate still images for people, yes. right? Yes, yes. Um, uh, I'm not sure. Can we play a... Um, maybe not this time. Uh, where... I have to admit I'm a little new to these Google Hangouts, so I apologize. Um, uh, yes, I have. I've done projects mostly working with, collaborating with uh, colleagues who are also good friends of mine. Um, I've done a lot of work with Alexis Varda, who does Kid Beowulf, which is a terrific graphic novel series. And um, if you haven't read it yet, it's great for adults or kids. It's really fun. Um, and I, he, I designed his logo, the basic Kid Beowulf logo. I also color the covers, so he sends me high-resolution scans, and we do these giant Photoshop files with, like, 50 layers and shading and all sorts of great stuff. And, and of course, we this case, Photoshop is mostly pixels. And so if I want to blow something up really big, where Illustrator, the files are really small, you know, all that texture and detail and stuff is vector ba um, is pixel based. You can make the image really big to print. So I do things like that. But I also um, have collaborated with him on promotional videos. Um, 
I've done about three or four with him, I believe. One for each book, as well as uh, a bonus one with his lovable pig, Hama, playing a record. Uh, I also just did one for a Kickstarter. Um, Kickstarter is all of a sudden the hot thing. I know in, in the art world, it's the hot thing now. Um, my friend Karen Look just did uh, Steampunk ABC, and if you go to that on her Kickstarter page, you can check out that video, which I also created. Of course, all these are available on my website to check out as well. What software do you use to uh, moving images? Uh, I'm a big fan of After Effects. Um, I I was doing playing with animation pre digital age. You know, before we had all this really the easy to use and open source and Adobe and all that crazy stuff. And so part of it is uh, I wanted a tool that I could combine images and different things together, and After Effects is really good for that. Um, you can bring Flash movies in, you can bring QuickTime movies, you can do your green screen, you can do get plugins for it, you can generate particles, you can uh, add sound, you can do all this stuff. And so put together these really elaborate things. You can take 2D layers and move in 3D, which I, I'm on. Um, uh, if you see the third trailer Lex has for his Kid Beowulf series, which might not be out yet, um, we did all three covers of his books, multiplane, where you kind of zoom through all the layers like a scene. Um, really fun, really fun stuff, and I love the power. As you said, motion comics has become sort of a buzzword, both good and bad, I think, where it's, um, for people who don't know, it's people taking comic art and... Uh, repurposing it into animation, so it's sort of an animated, it's sort of a uh, an audiobook version of a comic book, is maybe the best way of saying it, with voices, and they've gotten a little elaborate, and sometimes they do ones where they don't actually make a comic, they just draw comic looking art, which is a little weird because that's not really not a comic anymore, because comics you read, of course. You don't just watch them like a movie, that's kind of weird. Uh, <laughs> But I do have posts about it, if anyone's interested, on my blog. You just click the link that says Motion Comic Magic. Okay, maybe changing the topic a little bit. You also teach art yeah. classes, right? Drawing mostly? Yes, uh, art classes. I've taught, I've taught um, cartooning classes. I work at a youth center. I teach at the Cartoon Art Museum. I've taught at the Schultz Museum for their summer program and spring program. I've taught uh, after-school programs and private lessons, um, all sorts of stuff. It's, it's great. It's fun. It's one of the, the main things I do. Um, I've taught everything from computer graphics to animation, uh, Lego animation, uh, caricatures, cartooning. In fact, I'm even going to be doing a class at the Alternative Press Expo this weekend. Nice. Maybe you, can you tell us a little bit about the class you're teaching this weekend? It's yeah. At, it's at the Alternative Press Expo? Yeah, yeah. It's at 8, the Alternative Press Expo. I'm going to, um, I, give me a second here. I was going to, um, I was going to bring up an image here, and I'm confused because me and computers aren't happy together, I guess. Or something. So let me um, call up the image here just so I can talk about it. Aha, Alternative Press Expo, right there. Um, it's in San Francisco. It's on October 13th and 14th. And it's basically indie publishing, so we have indie comic books and art and art prints and toys and lots of handmade kind of Etsy crafty kind of hip, -er, hip cool things going on. It's a wonderful celebration. If anyone in the Bay Area nearby should come up and check it out. It's very reasonable to get in, only $10. Um, they have free workshops, hour-long workshops, all day, both Saturday and Sunday. I'll be teaching with the first one on noon on Saturday, October 13th, and it's on creating and designing fantasy characters using and uh, basically playing with uh, different elements and combining them together. So it's a hands-on workshop. It's going to be a lot of fun where I'm going to talk about stuff, we're going to draw together, and even I'm going to give you guys some challenges to work from. So, so I, you're going to do a class on fantasy drawing. What are some of your inspirations in terms of other fantasy art? Well, you know, it's tough. There's so much. With the internet, you know, pretty much everything in the world can be out there. Um, with classic stuff, I was a huge fan of Brian Froud, who designed characters for the Dark Crystal and the uh, Jim Henson film Dark Crystal and Labyrinth, and did the book Fairies. Um, beautiful artwork, and really a dark, dark versions of it. You know, it's 
when he draws fairies, they're not they're very pretty at sometimes, but they're also you know mean and spiky and sharp and they can and, be kind of then, fierce in a magical way. Uh, yes, and and probably you know, and this might sound wrong, but stereotypically not so feminine. You know, a little a little less sparkly and pink, basically, and rainbowy and happy. A, a bit more realistic, maybe is the best way of saying it. But um, I've been a big fan of his work ever since the Dark Crystal. Uh, watching uh, a video on on PBS of him drawing a Skeksy, 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 yes. Um, so that's a big influence in fantasy. Obviously, Disney films are pretty high on my list. Um, for more modern stuff, I love Adventure Time on Cartoon Network. Fantastic series, um, phenomenal series, and very creative and um, sort of fun for me to watch because generationally, it's sort of now it's it's people who are referencing things that I'm not the right generation for, but um, it does it in such a fun way everyone can enjoy it. I think. What about artists like uh, Charles Vess? Who, uh, Charles who, Vess is fantastic. He's uh, definitely I love his watercolor techniques, his drawing style. Um, I love um, even though it's not in stereotypical fantasy, uh, James Gurney who does Dinotopia, though. A lot of these artists, I don't work in the same styles, but I love their work. And so, what are you actually going to be teaching in the class uh, this weekend? Do you just start well, assuming that people already know how to draw, or do you just start with the basics? It's really about ideas, coming up with ideas. And it's silly. It, in some ways, it's going to be it's a little weird topic because it's it's something we all do, which is coming up with ideas is really just and being creative. It's really just combining different ideas together and trying different things. Uh, what I'm going to do is give some exercises to do that. So it's a hands-on workshop, um, more so pushing the hands-on element than actually information. Um, talking about creating a character together, but also using reference. Uh, it's going to be fun. We're going to be using some probably from a recent trip to Canada I had. Um, and, and being able to talk about how to break kind of the... Um, move away from stereotypical things into more applying sort of symbolic symbols and, and thematic things and stuff like that. It's something that we all do, but I think it's fun to be in a situation where we all work together at it. Sounds like it should be interesting. Mm -hmm. So if we can change topics just a little bit. Okay. You also are one of the organizers of a social group for artists, right? Yes, yes. Um, I helped form a group about, I want to say about a year ago, with George Weber of uh, uh, No Cash Comics, a very terrific artist, fellow there. And uh, our group was, we had been in previously in a, a different group, and it wasn't sort of going the directions we cared about. Things were getting a little, people were getting a little blasé, and so we broke off on our own and started this one, Ink, Drink, Draw, San Francisco. And what we do is we meet once a month. We meet in usually a restaurant or a bar or a museum, like the Cartoon Art Museum downtown. And we just talk about art. We draw. We hang out. We share what we're doing. I'll get feedback and just have a good time and, and really interact with each other. Because art is very solitary. It's, it's a lot of sitting around by yourself sometimes. And sometimes creating on your own. And you got to get out there and, and talk to real people in person. And so is anyone welcome to join you guys for oh, a yeah. draw yeah. evening? Yeah, any any level of artist, any even people who aren't an artist per se can hang out with us. We there's no biases. Um, this month we'll be meeting, I believe, the last Thursday of the month at a, a club in San Francisco where they have live painting on the walls. So that will be the theme, obviously. But it should be hopefully fun to have a bunch of our friends and acquaintances and new friends too get together and help us create. And so, that sounds like fun. Maybe now you could tell us a little bit about projects that you have in the works right now. Anything you can talk about? Uh, working on a new graphic novel. It's been really fun. One of the challenges for me, personally, is that I'm more an artist who's trying to write than a writer trying to draw. I think, I think a lot of people that succeed with their projects are ones who are the writing is stronger and they come into the art. I have many friends that way. Uh, I'm the opposite. I've always been drawing and uh, so what I've been doing is I have this pro longer term project I've been thinking about for years and just starting to work on it in which I've been really 
taking it as a, a chance to really learn about storytelling, story structure. I've been um, listening to a lot of wonderful blogs and, and uh, I'm sorry, podcasts. <laughs> you know, listen to a blog always. Uh, blogs and podcasts and figuring out all the techniques and really enjoying the process of not feeling like I have to get it done by a convention like Ape right away. I would like to have it done in the next year. Um, it's an idea I really like and I'm really excited about. So um, if people visit my blog and at Atomic Bear Press, um, I will start, I'm hoping to start updating in the next couple of weeks with some hints. Uh, all you'll know is that they'll have the initials DM as part of it. DM. Should be interesting. I look forward to seeing how it develops. Yeah. Yep. Well, I thank you very much for chatting with me today. Maybe we can do this again sometime. Love to, Peg. Love to hang out. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye, everyone.